Good morning, everyone. My name's Stephanie Piper. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator in the USQ Library, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to a session titled Hashtag Story Not Gadget, Materials, Processes and Ownership in Art Making by Marta Carbrell. Before we kick off, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping, and we'll start with an acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, the University of Southern Queensland recognises that it is situated on country for which the Jarawa and Guyabil people have been custodians for for many centuries, on which they have performed age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal. We acknowledge their living culture and unique role in the life of this region and offer our deep appreciation for their contribution, contribution to and support of our academic enterprise. Um, we'll also do a little bit of housekeeping. So if you have your mobile phones here, please make sure that they're on silent. If you need to go to the restroom, it's just outside in the foyer. And there's one exit. If necessary, please calmly make your way to it out to the northern, um, out to the northern engineering lawn area. This session is recorded and a link will be available on the USQ Salon website afterwards. <coughs> and um, got some slides. And any questions can be emailed to USQ Salon at usq.edu.au. Um, for those that are online, um, you can use the live stream chat to ask questions. And studio participants will be called on at the end of the presentation for any questions. You can also follow the session on Twitter with the hashtag USQ Salon um, hashtag. And before we kick off, I'd just like to do a quick little plug for the USQ Makerspace, what we've got on our home turf here. So uh, we have a number of upcoming events in August, including getting started with 3D printing, where you can learn to use the Makerspace 3D printer, 3D sculpting for 3D printing, and learning to code sessions. Marta's also already been up to our makerspace already. I have. And she has already been 3D scanned and 3D printed. And we do have a little demo of that here. Um, so there is Marta <laughs> in digital form. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'd also, I'm happy to announce that the makerspace officially has a uh, polygraph, which is a type of drawing machine. Um, so there it is there. So. It'll be up on display at the USQ Open Day. So if you'd like to come up to the makerspace during that time and get your photo taken, it will be drawn by the machine in 15 minutes. Very exciting stuff. But for now, I'll hand over to Marta for her session. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> And thank you, Steph, also for welcoming me to your wonderful makerspace. And I hope you all get a chance to visit because it's absolutely worth it. And I'm going to set my little self over here for now. <laughs> lying down. Um, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and by paying my respects to elders past, present and future. I'm very happy to be here and I'm here visiting from the land of other traditional owners where I work with people and I work with stuff. And so today this session is about art making, it's about materials, it's about ownership, but it's about a lot more than art and art materials because uh, working in an education institution like we all do, we're all in the business of people and all in the business of stuff. So we're thinking about people, relationships, aspirations, all of those things. Um, and there we go. <laughs> so um, I spend a lot of time in the studio myself, playing with materials myself. And that's a really important time to think about how important it is for me to be happy and frustrated and annoyed and excited about things. And to understand that my students also need the time and the support to feel happy and excited and annoyed and frustrated by things. Uh, let me give you the example of Nola, who's a child. I work with her until she graduated from preschool, from preschool. And when she went to kindergarten, her art teacher asked her to do something in a very specific way, something that would result in a very specific product. Uh, and as she was asked that, brand new to kindergarten, she raised her hand and asked, but that's not art. If you're just telling us what to do, that's not art. And I have to say, she had a point, but I don't think Nola was being confrontational. I don't think she was being difficult. She was a very strong, soft-spoken, determined girl. And what she was asked to do was just not in coordination to her notion of art and with her lived experiences of art. So she needed that clarification. 
just as Lena, another brand new kindergartner who got home one day with a, a clay peacock that she had made. And when her dad asked her, oh, why did you choose to make a peacock? She said, well, because I had to, because we all had to, because we were told to make a peacock. Um, this slide that you see here is a slide of Matisse working with one of his studio assistants. So he's a very influential artist, as you know. Uh, and particularly towards the end of his career, he worked a lot with his, with his studio assistants. So he would have them paint over pieces of paper. He would uh, have big cutouts and then place those cutouts or have them placed on the walls of his studio and other large surfaces. So the assistants would put the things up just as he told them to do. So it was Matisse's uh, choice of where things would go on the wall. It was his decision. So let's go back to where we started. Let's go back to this opening slide where you can see two of my students. So I am, uh, I teach in the art and art education program at Columbia University Teachers College. And I also run the art program at a lab school on campus, so an early childhood center which serves families with children zero to five years old. So this means that I work with infants, toddlers, preschoolers, and graduate students. I don't always work with all my students together, but sometimes they do visit each other's classrooms and studios. I normally work with the young kids during the day and with the master's and doctoral students in the evenings. But sometimes they do come together, and what you see in this photo is an example of that. Uh, as I piloted the community program in Macy Gallery, which is the, the art gallery that is the physical center of the art and art education program, so it's on campus, but it's a public gallery. Uh, and as I was asked to pilot a community program, I naturally got my students involved. So as I took care of the less than fascinating managerial details of the program, I, <laughs> I scaffolded my graduate students to create and deliver activities for children and their caregivers who would visit the, the exhibition that was on. So what you see in this photo is CJ, who is a brilliant artist and educator, and he, his current work is as diverse right now as designing posters for the Mermaid Parade in Coney Island, New York, or helping farmers in Nepal grafting macadamia nut trees using 3D prints that he designs and makes. And you also see Sabine, who's a very fearless and daring artist who's always willing to explore. And she likes to work with materials such as glass uh, and clay and paint. And she names boxes as her current favorite material. Or I should say current at the time I interviewed her around two months ago. So here you see the two artists working together. As you can imagine, I learn a lot by listening, and I learn a lot by observing my students in the studio. I observe them engaging with the materials, playing around, or just doing nothing, apparently doing nothing, and sitting and observing and having conversations with everyone. And I also learn a lot in the studio myself, playing with materials. Uh, and I learn how to think about things, and I learn how to be part of those dialogues. And I. A couple of things that I've been learning, maybe some of the most important things that I've been learning so far, one of them is to just let go, to get out of the way, to let my students do their thing, just like I like to do my thing. And that means with support rather than with interference. And another really important thing I've been learning is the meaning of figuring stuff out. So when I first started teaching, I thought, yes, of course, I want my students to figure stuff out. And what I thought that meant was that, you know, I'll give them questions and then they would be such good questions because I would prepare it so well uh, that my students would be so enthused by the brilliancy of my questions about the world that they would happily devote their minds and their bodies to just find the answers I was looking for. That's not how it works, as it turns out. I think now that more than finding answers, figuring stuff out is about finding problems. It's about finding the problems, creating the problems that we ourselves find are worth our time and our attention, the things that we really want to spend uh, our time thinking about. So 
more than holding my students' hand while they'll climb the stair of scaffolded stepping stones of knowledge that I place in front of them, my job is to help them finding their own climbing challenges, whatever those climbing challenges may be, is to help them find their very own wonderful ideas. And this notion of having wonderful ideas is something that I've learned from Eleanor Duckworth and her work, namely this book of essays um, called The Having of Wonderful Ideas, in which she talks about the way she engages with her students in many different ways. So she poses that the more we help students having their own wonderful ideas and feeling good about that, the more likely it is that one day they will happen upon wonderful ideas that no one else has ever happened upon before. So in her long career as a teacher, as a teacher educator, as a, 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 a theorist of education, she has been grappling with the question, how do people learn and what can other people do to help? I don't claim to take it that far myself, but I do think about the things that I do and I do think about how I can sustain, support my students in finding their own climbing challenges and their own ways of learning and their own things to learn. I think a lot my, about my quizzical itch. What is my quizzical itch? While I was working on the initial stages of doctoral research, um, Graham Sullivan, who is my mentor, and he was one of my advisors, he kept asking me that. What's the thing that bugs you? What's the thing that really tickles you and wonders you and marvels you? Basically, what's the thing that bothers you enough so that you actually get this thing done? Um, what's my quizzical itch? And I don't need to tell you that that's easier said than done to find that out because there's a reason why theses and dissertations take a long time because it does take a long time to figure out our quizzical itch. It, in order to be able to find that, we need time and we need space to mess around with things. And we also need to feel safe in knowing that our failures and our frustrations and our not answers are going to be just as welcome and just as um, appreciated as our successes and the things that we're happy about and the things that we actually find out and have answers for. So yes, it takes time, things take time. Uh, so if we do ask our students questions, they are likely to come up with solutions, with useful solutions that actually answer those problems, suitable things. Uh, however, if we only ever ask them questions, if we don't let them come up with their own questions, they, what they might never find out is what is it that is their quizzical itch? What are the things that they really wanted to know about? And what that means is that we all will miss out on having passionate researchers, researchers doing their own thing. And we might find that if we do let our students and let everyone find their thing, then we might learn a lot deeper and a lot broader about things in the world and questions that we would never think of asking before. For example, uh, that's why it's so important to have in the studio or wherever we are, different materials and different ways of looking at things because that's what materials offer. They offer different ways to create problems. They offer different ways to look at the world. They offer us different things to think about, different ways to think about things mostly. For example, 3D designing and printing. It offers a way of looking at objects and looking at things that is very different from making marks on a paper. However, think about making marks on a piece of paper. Think about what you feel, or maybe the last time you felt that. Think about if you use a crayon and you have the crayon going on your paper, that texture of the paper that you feel, maybe you're using a heavier paper, maybe you're using something that slides really well, maybe you're using a really thick crayon, or maybe you're using just a very fine ball pen, and maybe it even has a smell. So there's a lot that goes into that that you don't get on a screen. So both of them are equally important, they just offer very different ways of looking at things which is, if you see, look at those images, you see that that girl is grappling with that one idea, that idea of an egg. Uh, it was around Easter time, she was very keen on eggs. Uh, <laughs> and she was really thinking about that using all of those materials. She was pushing into having those ideas coming up. Thank you. <laughs> 
Another example is clay. Clay is really good to think about volume and balance and texture again. Imagine if uh, clay is heavy, right? If you think about it, if you've ever held clay, it's very different from Play-Doh, for example, or from blue tech. Clay has that weight. And imagine that you're a big person and you're holding a piece of clay, you feel the weight. Now imagine that you're this big and you're holding the same piece of clay. It's really a full body exercise and, and it gives you something that nothing else gives you. But if you work with collage, for example, you get a lot of ideas on shape, on composition, on color even maybe, maybe even on texture. So it brings a whole different set of things into, into play. Another example is augmented reality. It does allow us to see different things, to have different layers that a single painting would not. And what you see here in this image is two girls using augmented reality uh, as they, they look at a painting. So you may see that they're actually both looking at the same painting on the wall, that the, the uh, lower uh, corner one slightly yellow greenish. Uh, and as they point their iPads at it, they're scanning it with a, a, an app that is already on the iPad, a free downloadable app from the internet, really simple. And as they point at it, they're seeing the painting, but overlaying the painting, they're seeing a video of the child who painted that painting at work. So as they scan the painting, they see the painter, they see the making of that same painting. These children are actually in a gallery, the same gallery I already told you about, uh, which is where I curate every year uh, an art exhibition of works by my infant, toddler and preschool students. Uh, this year's exhibition was called We're Not Even Close to Being Done, Art and the Making of It. And it was a title that came out of a suggestion of one of the preschoolers, like it usually happens. Um, so, as I said, this gallery is in the Art and Art Education program. It's a public space, anyone can, anywhere can go there. And the children are very invested in having their work up. They visit the gallery very often during the school year, so they know that it's an art gallery, they know that artists exhibit their work there. So when it comes to them, when it's their turn to exhibit their work, they're thinking about it very seriously. They're, they're, they're very um, entitled to have their work there as artists who have been thinking about that all year. And as you can see in the following slide, these are just a few images of exhibitions that happened um, over the years. They're not all the same year. You see that in one of the images, there's a child pointing at uh, a poster that was there about her, uh, in which she had a few words about herself. There was a, a photo of her, and if we were to scan that photo, we would see um, something that would come up. But you see also that what's missing in the other images is precisely the children. Uh, their work is there. In some ways, that means that they're there too. But there's not a lot of interaction. And that's something that I was trying to understand better. So that's one a problem that I created for myself that I wanted to solve. So how can I get the children to be more and more involved in their own art exhibition? Um, how can I get them to own not just the artworks that they produce, but the exhibition as something that is theirs? Uh, when, when we can, the children spend a lot of time in the gallery. So we do have guided tours, we have visitors coming up, and the artists guide the visitors throughout the exhibition. They talk about their work, they talk about other people's work, they answer questions, they talk about materials and processes. They often have visitors trying out those processes with materials that we have available there. But as I was talking to the children one year and we were trying to see, okay, so we're not always there. What, what are we going to do? How are you going to fix that problem? How can we, uh, can we be there all the time and talk to the children? And one of the preschoolers just turned to me and said, no, we don't have any time for that. We don't have any time to just be in the gallery all week because, you know, they're busy people, these preschoolers. They're, they're busy napping, they're busy having snacks, they're being play, busy playing in the park. If it's summer, there's water sprinkles, they're busy with that. They're busy with playing in their classroom. They're busy with being preschoolers and toddlers and infants. They're busy with life. 
and I can't just interrupt their life to just have them in the gallery all the time because you don't want to be doing the same thing all the time and you do have to fulfill all those other obligations. So how was I going to fix that? How was I going to help the children being there more? And augmented reality did give me one possible solution to that. So for example, a minute ago, you saw Lucy holding her artwork, like you see in that top photo there, which is something that she liked to do when she was in the gallery and when she was guiding visitors around. But if Lucy was busy and she could not be in the gallery at that time, you could scan the artwork, uh, the black artwork that you see there, and you could scan it using your own device, or you could scan it using one of the devices available in the gallery that was my personal devices that I leave there. And if you were to scan Lucy's artwork by pointing the device to her artwork, you would see a video that you see over there, and there's a good chance you would actually see it upside up. Uh, <laughs> And that's because it's what Lucy chose to have when people scan her artwork. For the younger children, sometimes it happens that it's a candid video. If it's a six-month-old baby, it probably will be a candid video of the child painting. Children like Lucy sometimes want to create another video that is an artist statement about that specific piece, or they want to show one of the candid videos that we shot while they were making. Another way that we use augmented reality in this show is by having artist statements that, again, the artists are invited to perform. Not necessarily about their work, but separate from their work. So as you walk into the gallery, you see photos of each child, and each child, each child decides what they want visitors to see. So they're invited to talk about themselves, to talk about things that they like to do, their favorite materials, or to talk about things that they really like. Be those things applesauce, shiny purple glitter, uh, watercolors or playing in the park, whatever it is that they feel they want the world to know about them as artists. Lucy and her sister Sophie are in the same school, different classrooms, and they welcomed the opportunities to work together. So they decided they wanted to show this video. Ready. Welcome to our art studio. This is Sophie, this is Lucy, and we, we would like you to see how amazing our all studios. Please come soon, Sophie and Lucy. We did several different takes. They chose this one. <laughs> So when I show these videos to parents, to families, to visitors, to my students, um, people are often surprised. Uh, a lot of people have not uh, worked with augmented reality before, and it is kind of a fancy thing. It's like sometimes there's like a little gnome inside the iPad showing the video of the little child coming up. Um, and I think about that. What, what is it about it? Why, why am I using this in the end? And the question often comes up about preparing them. First time I worked with uh, 3D designing and printing, I was asked, so how are you going to prepare them for that? I think, what do you mean prepare them? The same way that I prepare them for doing paint, by giving them paints. Uh, the same way that I'm preparing, well, maybe I put a t-shirt on so that they don't get paint all over. Maybe I don't, but that's the same. The question was not making a lot of sense to me until I thought about my own graduate classes and the way I was presenting it to my graduate students. I myself was doing that distinction. Uh, so I'm not a specialist in printmaking, yet I work printmaking with my students. I'm not a specialist in clay or ceramics, yes, yet I do that with my students. Yet when I started working with, three, with the, um, digital materials in class, I had a guest speaker coming in and we had a good 30, 40 minutes of talking to them about digital materials and how they're so cool and so not scary and you shouldn't be afraid. And just like we tell kids, don't be afraid of the dentist, don't be afraid of the dentist. We all know how that ends. Same thing. <laughs> And then it hit me, and then I realized, well, I'm not doing that. I, I, I'm not using, I'm not treating digital materials the same way I, I treat other materials. So I started handing it out to students just the same way. I start saying, here's an app, figure it out. Here's this, figure it out. And that's when things changed. And my students started actually finding their own questions and they started coming up with a lot more digital materials that I had never heard of. And things became so rich because I changed the way I was approaching it. I stopped giving them my own problems and my own questions, and I let him be. And it took me a while <laughs> to do that. So 
when we're in the studio or in the classroom or wherever we are and we use different materials and whatever sort of things that we're playing around with, it's so that our students can explore and can discover and can figure their thing out. It's not so that they can make pretty things that we can post on social media. It's not about the pretty things. It's not about those pictures. However, it's not unusual that pretty things do happen. <laughs> Because when we work with uh, different materials, when we work with materials that are good quality, that are open-ended, and that may be a really good watercolor paper, that may be an old school cork, that may be a cardboard box that is just asking to be used, when we use those open-ended materials in open-ended ways, pretty things actually do happen many times because as we are shaping our thoughts, we are also shaping those materials and it's not unusual that we come up with uh, products that are as elaborate uh, and as invested as our explorations were. But those products are not really products, they're more like byproducts of our explorations because they happen as we do it and not uh, as a goal. So they're a consequence of what happens, they're not a goal of our explorations. And that makes uh, that make a big difference when we're thinking about things and when we are dealing with those products as byproducts. Let me give you an example, another example of Maria and her hiding lizard. When we look at the objects that we have, at those byproducts, they exist as memories of our experiences. They exist as something that we can look at and we can say, oh, remember when I was doing this and that, and I learned this and that, and I was feeling in that way, and I was so frustrated, and then I was so excited, and then I was so annoyed, and then I was so happy. And all those things come when we have those physical objects that are memories of our lived experiences. But for Maria, she was reminded of things not only by what she saw in her artwork, but also by what she did not see. And that was the hiding lizard. So when Maria was showing her artwork, she would talk about the lizard, the lizard, and her friends and I would look at it and say, but I don't see the lizard. And as she looked at it again, she realized she didn't see the lizard either. So naturally, she reasoned, the lizard is hiding. I made it hide. You know how she made it hide? <laughs> she was rummaging through a bin packed with bottle caps. Bottle caps are great. They're one of my favorite materials and they have uh, normally a lot of um, letters or drawings or prints or whatever it is on that side. And she found one with a lizard that she really, really liked by first thing in the morning, actually. She played around with it. She played around with other things in the studio. And at some point, she went back to try to find it and she couldn't find it. And she spent a good amount of time in that bin trying to find that one bottle cap. And when she found it, she decided to put some glue on it and put it down on the piece of paper that she was working on. And then she showed it to someone else and realized that the lizard was hiding, that she had made the lizard hide. It's her artwork. So does this happen every time, this kind of ownership over their work? No, it does not. <laughs> but as teachers, it's our job as educators to do our best to create the conditions in which it can actually happen. So how do we do it? I call it, I like to call it, uh, deflected and reflected discourses. And these are discourses that happen between us and the materials, us and our students, between the students themselves. And as an example, here, here's Thea's first experiment with paint. And we can notice a number of things in these um, images. Anything specific that you notice? You're welcome to shout out. What do you see there? Red fingers? Yeah? Looks like there's a story of uh, the baby going, I'm not sure about this. Maybe the baby is going, I'm not sure about this. I thought so too, looking at those red fingers. Because what makes you say that? Because he's looking up to someone who has their arm around him, who mm -hmm. seems to be a, a comforting or a, you know, a nice person. So I think he's going. 
That's something that I find really important. This was her first experience with pain, and as you can see, she's a young baby. Uh, so she was in a comfortable environment, in what I hope was a comfortable environment for her. Uh, there was a familiar thing that she felt okay with, because I wouldn't want to put her new material, new person, new space, new everything all at once. Uh, so when I work with young babies who don't know me all that well, it's not unusual that I ask their head teachers to be with them and to hold them in their laps precisely so that it's familiar. Um, or I just work with them myself, see if we already have a relationship. Another thing that you notice is that while well, her fingers got red because she got them red, nobody else did that for her. You may notice that no one is holding her hand and dipping her hand in the paint and making her touch anything, it's her call. So yes, I initiated that dialogue by putting the paint within her reach, but then she decided to go and touch it. She could have just deflected it and not touch it, and that, that does happen, and that's a very valid response and a respected response. But in this case, she chose to touch it, and she chose to like, hold it in her fingers. And then she does look for reassurance, as in, is this okay? And you know, it looks to me that she already knows a thing or two about the world, and she already knows that things that feel like that, like kind of soup or poop or yogurt or things that feel like that, she's not supposed to squish between her fingers. So naturally, she asks for reassurance. And she's given that reassurance when she asks for it. She's not being constantly bombarded by verbal input. She says she's doing her thing when she needs some sort of feedback, she gets it. And this is the same reassurance I give Xenia, one of my graduate students, as she uses a, a torch to pop open a glass bottle, like these other students are doing in this image. Uh, Xenia, as she was working, she was saying, my mother told me to never play with glass and to never play with fire. And here I am doing both. <laughs> so she's a grown woman. She's a, a master's student. She's a teacher herself. Yet, when something changes in her world, she asks for reassurance, just like Thea does, just like we all do. And this class that she took is a class called Art for Classroom Teachers, and it's one of my favorite classes to teach. Uh, these are, my students are doctoral and, and master's students in very diverse feel, fields, such as uh, occupational therapy, or math education, or brain and cognition, or music education. Uh, and they come to me saying they're not artistic and they're not creative. Uh, and a lot of them haven't really touched any art materials since kindergarten themselves. However, being not creative and not artistic is never my challenge with them. They're as capable as working with materials as anybody else is. My challenge is to have them trust that exploration is what we want in this course, that they're not going to be graded by their finest products, whatever they take to be their finest product, but by their willing to do invested explorations, by their willingness to not know. Um, so these students, they're graduate students, they're pursuing advanced degrees in an Ivy League school. They got it down by now, what it means to be a good student. They know what it's like. They do their readings, they write their papers, they give all the correct answers to the questions asked in class. That's how you're a good student. But, however, what I'm asking of them in this class, it's a very different thing. I'm asking them to be okay with not knowing. I'm asking them to be okay with surround with materials without having a specific direction as to what it's gonna look like in the end. I'm asking them to find their own questions. I'm asking them to be uncertain about things, and that can be very unsettling. So adults and children, they're all different and they have their specificities, but they need and should be respected just the same. So say for example, adults are often big and heavy and it's hard to just pick them up and just sit them over there and hold their arms out, their hands up and dip it in paint so that I can have a nice handprint to send home for Mother's Day. It can be a little difficult for me to physically do that. So say that, for example, I would just sneak in behind you, pick you up, and sit you right there because we have more room in that side of the, of the room. There's a good chance you'd be startled and frightened and that you wouldn't like it. And there's an equally good chance that a child would be equally startled and scared and she might not like it. Yet, 
the children who we do this to, they might not just know any better because we have conditioned them to do nothing. So there's less of a chance that they're able to just say, no, I, I, don't, I don't want this. And so we just tend to manhandle their bodies without a word of reassurance, without a word of permission, or even just warning, just because we can, just because we're physically able to lift them and put them down somewhere else. So when working with both children and adults, it's some of the most important things are just the same. The question of respect is just the same. And with children and with adults too, not only we do things to them and we tell them to do things and we tell them how to do those things. Let me tell you another story. My cousin got home one day really excited saying, Merry Christmas, Mom, Merry Christmas. Look what my teacher made for you. Look what my teacher made for you. Yes, she was excited about bringing something home. I'm also excited when I go to the store and buy my mom a present that I think she will like. Uh, but the ownership she had over that product didn't seem to be that strong. She was the one who physically glued the cotton balls on the assigned template, the assigned spot on the Frosty the Snowman temple that she was given. So her hands did that. But it wasn't her choice. It wasn't her wonderful idea. It wasn't really her artwork. Uh, that's why she was saying, look, I want my teacher made for you. Thank you. <laughs> So when we started working with 3D designing and printing, I had all of those questions in mind. Are my children going to own this? Is this meaningful for them? Am I just doing this because it's a new, cool, sexy thing? Well, this was a few years ago. <laughs> uh, and as the, the way the 3D designing and printing started, it took me a little bit off guard because I didn't plan for it, but that's what happens with most of the most important explorations we do. So I did plan to bring my kids to the gallery, and I did plan to let them roam around and find the things that interested them, and I did plan to talk with them about it, and I did plan to bring them back to the studio and give them other materials responding to the things that they were curious about. So when, when Daniel asked me about that box there, making things and spitting out a little string of plastic, I didn't have a lot to say. All I knew is that it was called a MakerBot, it was a 3D printer, and we had a couple on campus, and I actually had a friend who knew how to work them. And he said, well, I have a friend who would like to know how to work them. <laughs> Next thing we know, the four of us are in the media studio visiting my friend Sean Justice, who helped us figuring 3D designing and printing out. The four-year-olds and I, we just learned it together. But because this is academia and because Sean and I couldn't help ourselves, we had to turn it into a study. And we had to try to figure out more about it. And as we went to it, I did have these strong questions in my mind. Are my children going to own this? And so we listened to what they said and we listened to the way Daniel described the process. I told the computer what to do, the computer told the printer what to do, and the printer did it. The printer made my work. I, Marta, her teacher, the hand who physically held the thing and make it move, not even worth mentioning. I'm not even in the picture. I'm just there to make him, help him manipulating a mouse that is too big for his hand and that is made for adult dexterity. He's a kid who can barely sit himself up on the office chair, so I'm just there to facilitate those things. But I'm not really even in the picture. I'm just a tool. Uh, and emotional bruises apart, I was thrilled <laughs> because that means that I'm doing my job. It means that I'm building my own redundancy, which is another of Graham Sullivan, my mentor's buzz ideas, that the role of the teacher is to build their own redundancy. And I was doing that because my kids didn't need me. I, I hope they like to work with me the same way that I like to work with some tools better than others. They do the job for me. But I don't depend on them to have my own ideas and to work. The same thing that they don't depend on me. And that's my job. And we go back to Matisse because Daniel's, Daniel's words take us there. The computer, I told the computer what to do. I tell my assistants what to do. In sharp contrast, contrast with Nola being told that she had to do things a, a certain way that in her mind did not qualify as art, to Lena being told to make that peacock. So Matisse is there instructing his assistants as to what to do. And it's his time to feel happy and annoyed and frustrated and excited because it's his choice, because it's his work. 
just the same way as my infants do, as I do, as my grad students do, as we all do in our lives. It's our work, it's our choice. When we are told what to do, when we're told to make a peacock, we can definitely think about the world as we are told it is, and that's an important thing. But Alison Gopnik reminds us that more than thinking about the world as it is, it's also important to consider the ways the world might actually be, not just the ways the world actually is. And Alison Gopnik is, to my knowledge, not in art education. She's a professor of psychology. She does a number of really cool experiments in her lab, but yet, I think we work in the same field because we work in the field of figuring stuff out. Uh, we work in the field of listening to children. And some of the experiments that I read about, for example, in this great book, The Philosophical Baby, make me think a lot of the things that I see happening in the studio and in the classroom with my young children, with the very young babies who I work with. So for example, she talks about how uh, she uh, worked with babies in their cribs and she figured out that when the baby's uh, leg motions would trigger a mobile to move around and make sound, those babies who were able to, by moving their legs and kicking, making something go, they would move their legs a lot more. And that makes me think of infants, young children, starting to make marks and to realize that they can make those marks. So imagine, there's a kid, just a white piece of paper, playing around with crayons, and I like to use those block crayons that are like construction things that they can work with. I don't even tell them they're crayons, they just eventually figure it out. Or working with a paintbrush or with their hands, with paint that they can dip their hands around. Whatever it is, think of a kid with a mark-making tool. And think of that kid discovering all of the sudden while they play that, oh look, there's a mark there. That mark was not there before and it is now. Wait, I made that mark. There was nothing there, and now there's a mark that I made. I changed the world. When I do this, I make a mark. When I do this in this way, I make this mark. So different motions make different marks. I can make a mark whenever I want, and I can make this mark whenever I want. I change the world, I can't change the world. So my actions have consequences. And if I think about it, my actions have consequences. There's not a lot of lessons in life that are more important than that, than my life. My actions have consequences. And that is something that can be learned by playing around with art materials, with things just as simple as realizing that I made that mark there, that mark was not there and I made it. And we changed the world. So art materials are a really good way of helping us looking at things as if they could be otherwise, like Maxine Green reminds us. Maxine Green was a philosopher. Uh, she, worked, she taught at Teachers College um, until the time of her death, not that long ago. And when you saw her walking in, even when she was walking in with her on her wheelchair, with her black beret on, you could really see that she was a woman of possibilities and a person uh, that would look at the world in many different ways. And Releasing the Imagination is a really good book to help us think about that. Looking at things as if they could be otherwise. Just like for Andrew McDonald does. Andrew McDonald is a very interesting person who I met not that long ago. I was hanging out with him yesterday at the Cobb & Co Museum, right here in Toowoomba. Uh, he's a fantastic person that I just met right now and who was working there after having taught for 20 years in this very same institution. He used to teach in this university for 20 years. And as he works in the museum now, he's the, 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 the factory manager, so he spends a lot of his time figuring stuff out. He finds solutions to a lot of problems. Uh, Cobb & Co is a, a, a museum that has a lot of carts and a lot of transportation, and those things need maintenance. Uh, when I walked in the other day, they have this new cart that I think was just donated, and one of the wheels is off, it's really old, a lot of things are not working, so it's Andrew's job to figure out how he's gonna fix all those things, how he's gonna make that look like he used to look before when he was used 100 years ago. Uh, and I'm assuming that, well, I did see a lot of tools there, and I did see a lot of tools that I'm not used to seeing. 
like his jigs that he creates when he has a problem that he needs to solve. So for example, if he has to fix that wheel in a certain way and he doesn't have a tool that does exactly that, he will build a jig. He will, be, will build something to fix that problem that the cart presented to them because the museum people told him this sh should be looking like he used to look before. And that's really interesting and I've been really lucky to have the time while I'm here in Toowoomba to hang out with him over there and see that happening. But then he does something else. He also creates a different kind of tool, which are the fictitious tools you see here. So take a close look. What's one thing you notice about those tools? Or one of those tools? Not sure how clear it is in the image, but there's a little thing with the feather. Um, you can also see it over there that might be clear. Uh, a little chisel made out of a little wood branch. They look like they'd be useful. They look like they'd be useful. But you've got no way of, you can't guess, it's quite hard to work out what you'd use them for. <laughs> well, maybe that's the great thing that they do. Maybe they, don't, they were not created to fix a specific problem. And I know this is my interpretation of Andrew's work, but maybe they're not created to fix a specific problem, but they're made to make you think of what other problems you can create that these tools would work for or that would make you create other tools to work. So not only they're, very, they're, they're, they're not supposed to work on a specific practical problem, but they're supposed to make you think of other problems, to make you look at the world as if it could be otherwise, to maybe create your own tools with modern materials you have at hand. So art is indeed an expression of how we do autonomy. And that's something that I've learned from John Baldacchino, who's also a philosopher and an artist himself, and he was my master's advisor at Columbia University. And when I came to him, I had been teaching for 10 years, and I kind of knew that my job was to build my own redundancy, like Dan Graham phrased it for me, but I wasn't really using that many art materials. I was using other things. And one of the things John helped me realize was that art education was a really good way to do that. It was not changing the things that I was doing because like I said, it's not all about art, but it's about doing what we do. And to me, using art materials was a great way of doing that, of doing that autonomy. And so, if you've been here with me for the past 40 minutes, you will know by now that what I think about it is that it's not about the prettiness and it's not about the gadgetry and it's not about things that we can post on social media. It's really about that notion of ownership. It's about trusting ourselves as people who are capable of having wonderful ideas that are worth investigating and by the same token, respecting other people as such. It's about the business of looking at the world. It's about the business of finding our role in the world as makers of it, is to, to realize that our actions have consequences and what we want our con that those consequences to be. And one of the big reasons we're talking about this is to fit it in, in our lives, whatever it is that we do. So think about last time you were fussing around with Excel or that you were maybe tinkering with that car over the weekend or you just had that tool that wasn't working or you were you really need onions chopped really really finely and you have to figure out the best way to do it all of that is working with materials all of that is material inquiry the time that we spend just trying to figure something out is our time wherever we are to feel happy and frustrated and annoyed and excited. It's our time to figure our own thing out. So it is our task to just get our hands dirty with materials and to find out what it is that we want to invest our time with. One of the reasons I do what I do is because I have a really trusting director, Susan, Susan Recchia, who was my, one of my doctoral advisors and who's my director at the, the Rita Gold Center where I work. She's a very trusting person and she helps me by asking me questions, by helping me figure things out to just do what I do. I could not do what I do if I had someone just saying, okay, it's Tuesday, 10 a.m., this is what you'll be doing with your children. Because yes, it'd be fine, 
but it, I, I wouldn't be able to listen to the children in the same way. So what I do with my children and art materials is the same thing that my director does with me. It's the same thing that we do with our uh, students. It's the same thing that we do with anyone in our jobs. It's the same thing that we do with anyone in life, really. So I will add one more thing this time around, which is, yes, you should feel welcomed and you should feel supported in getting your hands dirty with materials if you want to. It doesn't matter if your material is chopped onions or an Excel spreadsheet or if it's tinkering with the car over the weekend, you should be welcomed and encouraged to do so. And it's really important, specifically if, we're, if we are thinking about learning and teaching, let others do their own thing as well. If it's their job, if it's their thing, well, let them own it. We do our thing, I do my thing, you do your thing, and we do it the best we can. And we let others do theirs. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Marta. That was a fantastic insight into some of the, <laughs> the cool stuff that you do. So we'll kick off with the questions now. And um, I'd like to start off with a question. Um, you showed us some of the... Um, augmented reality style mm -hmm. stuff that you're doing with the preschoolers. How did you um, get involved with that and what, what program were you using? I used mostly Orasma. Uh, so far it's the tool that I found that responds best to what I wanted to do. I think uh, there's a lot of other things that by using it I now know that I would like it to do. So I kind of wish now, okay, I should uh, be able to talk to people to be able to tinker with that because now I have questions that I want to ask. I want to ask Orasma. Uh, <laughs> when I start working with it, it was mostly because I was trying to find, okay, what can I find that will help me uh, figuring this problem out? And that's what I found. <laughs> okay, any questions from the audience? Sure, I have the microphone. Hi, my, my name is Bill Wade. Um, really appreciate uh, the work you're doing. And you're okay. also situated in the area of pre-service teacher education and, and that in Colombia. And one of, one of the things in Australia around our Australian curriculum uh, around art is this dialogue about do we set curriculum time per school year aside mm -hmm. specifically for art or do we teach teachers just to integrate it as part of the, the process and that. And I wonder if you have thoughts on, on the better way to go there because I have concerns that if it's entirely always integrated, you're just interested in the end product but not the, the process. Do you have thoughts on that? I have thoughts and concerns, just like you do. <laughs> and I think having those concerns is really important because it's what makes us think. Uh, if I had it my way, <laughs> I think that I would like for both things to happen. Um, and I supervise student teachers uh, in the, who are K-12 art teachers, so I do spend a lot of time in, in K-12 art classrooms working specifically with le lessons that are planned and I help my students plan. Uh, and then I think about the way I work with my young kids because I, have, I, I work in a play-based institution that is really open to that, in which I mostly let them choose whatever it is that they want to explore that day. Uh, and then, of course, I respond to that with things. I prompt them to go a little further. I try to nudge them into, but what if, but what if? But it's basically responding to what it is that they are bringing up. And I do notice that it is wonderful to do things in the classroom, and I try to work more and more with the classroom teachers just so that it can always be there and that it can always be available, and it can be something that you have an idea. What about if we work with materials to think about that idea? What about if we're working with materials and then we decide, oh, now I have an idea. So it's really nice to have things integrated in the classroom, to have it part as a thing, because that's what life is, uh, what art is. Art is just a part of life. Art is not something that happens when you go to the museum. Art is just what it is. It's just how we face life. However, I also find that it's really important the time that I spend with students in the art studio outside of the classroom in which I work with a smaller group of kids who want to go there and that they're really focused on something. They're really focused on materials. And it's also helpful because I have so many materials there that I can just bring things out in response to what it is that, that they're asking. So I think both of them have their place. Uh, 
it's really, I feel privileged that I can be in the school almost every day uh, and not necessarily have an assigned, an assigned time for, I do have an assigned time for art and that's the time that I often spend in a studio and it's really helpful, but I think it's a privilege to also have non-assigned time that I can just hang out in the classroom and see what happens there. And when I was, for example, teaching fourth graders, um, I wasn't really allowed to do music or art or anything like that, so I had to sneak that in. And one way that I found to sneak that in was that I did music with them for five minutes as soon as they came in, because that time is not really assigned to anything. So I was not allowed to have a weekly block of an hour, however long, 45 minutes uh, to do music. But if I sneaked five minutes in every morning, it worked just fine. No one really thought of that as a waste of time because they would be just settling in. And yet, whenever there was something going on and I started um, singing, we started singing as a choir the stuff that we had already practiced. We started doing call and response, rhythm games, all of that. It was just everyone came together in a way that it didn't happen in any other occasion by sneaking it in. <laughs> so I think both have their place. Long story short, long answer to your question. <laughs> uh, we had a question at the back. Hi, uh, my name's Ken. Uh, Marta, thank you very much. I showed up around five, ten minutes late. So if this got covered, just say so. I noticed that uh, in your last, what you were explaining there had a communal quality to it. I also noticed that most of the images that you were covering, you had um, children working quite independently, or even the adults mm -hmm. working quite independently. Um, uh, what's the sort of process that you go through, or do you go through a process in regard to sort of promoting or allowing or supporting or incentivizing or catalyzing community and individual time as you're, you're engaging in this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, again, I think both of them are important. Um, they are quite independent, but it's a scaffolded independence. So I just don't go in on first day and say, here is a torch, just get it to fire something. I don't just say, here's a hot glue gun, here's a hammer, here's some nails, here's, uh, it doesn't happen like that. Uh, we start working with things little by little. Uh, I, it's like starting to walk. You can have a child since they're very young, just holding them all the time and never letting them find their balance. And one day they will walk on their own, but it's because they're always, or it can take longer, but you can just, let them do their thing and they'll eventually they'll fall uh, but they'll figure it out and that's kind of what I do with the materials as well. I don't hold their hands from the very beginning and teach them to do something but I just make it available in a safe way uh, so that they can figure it out in their own rhythm. So some things, yes, I do physically help them creating it, uh, uh, holding the materials when they need help like I was holding the mouse for them but I do it in a way that is, is responding to them. And with adults, just the same. So when you see those adults wor working with the torches and the glass, um, I took them that Art for Classroom Teachers course. It's a very, it's a survey of materials for people who are not familiar with art materials. So it's a very, it's an introduction to all of those materials. And glass is one of them. I, I, I work with glass myself, so I enjoy bringing my students to the studio where I work. And for most of those adult students, working with that torch was really scary. And bear in mind, that's a kitchen torch, like a creme brulee thing that you work for your thing. So it's not like a threatening thing. Um, but it can be quite scary. Uh, and I do have to scaffold them in that. And that's both an individual process and it's also a community process. And because if we're there, if I have, uh, uh, we tend to work in smaller groups and different people are doing different things, but say that we have six students there and they're all looking at the torch. If I ask Stephanie to do it first and she hasn't touched the torch or maybe ever in her life and her mother told her never to play with fire, uh, she might be scared and everyone else is looking at her and there's a good chance that she's gonna be a little nervous and just fumble around with that a little bit. There's also a good chance that I'll tell everyone, hey, she's got the hardest job. When it gets to be your turn, you've already done it like three times when it gets to you because she did it and she did it and she did it. So even though you were not physically holding, you're part of this community of people doing this. So take one for the team. It's <laughs> you're doing it first. Um, all of those things, even the art exhibition, the children, uh, talk about everything that everybody else made. It's not just their art show, the way that we choose the title. It has to be something that speaks to uh, our ideas of infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. It's not just you and that. It's not just you and that. It's, it's also not a vote. It's more of a conversation. How are we going to get to something that is a community thing here? So 
I do think that both of them are important. Uh, it's important to have individual time to work on our own things, as much as it's important to have instances in which we can work together and work in the studio. And I often give them materials that they can work on together, large canvases, large pieces of things. But if I'm working on something that is my own and someone else wants to put marks on it, they need to ask. Just the same way that if we're doing painting and have paint all over myself, if I want to touch you, I need to ask you. It's never too early to know that, to learn that yes is yes, no is no. If I don't want to be touched, I will say no, and you're not allowed to do that. So again, it's very important to find that individuality, to know that I have a voice and I made those changes, but I do that in a context. I do that with people. I do nothing of this on my own, alone. Okay. Okay. We have yeah. one final question down the front. My, hi, I'm Bernadette Lynch. I, um, I teach into business, so you may be wondering why I'm here. But I'm interested in students having some ownership of reflective mm -hmm. assignments about the assumptions that they make. The thing I struggle with is, for me, when I'm doing the actual assessment, mm -hmm. the, 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 what you would regard as the byproduct of the mm -hmm. process, which is the assignment, is for me the proxy of what they're thinking. And... I guess I'm trying to work out how you juggle the value students put on what is the byproduct mm -hmm. with what you want them to value, which is the experience, and how you can do that honestly. Because to be frank, they're wanting, they're allowed to buy into the byproduct as far as I'm concerned and have it valued by someone else in a particular way. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, I'm not sure if my question's very clear, but you've got a process there that's all about ownership mm -hmm. and uh, the system is saying yeah 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 but really <laughs> what I'm going to do is give you a grade at the end of the day mm -hmm. for the byproduct so I'm just wondering how you manage that with it's a, a very good question. I struggle with it myself because you know, by the end of the semester, I do need to grade my students. I do, do need to go on Canvas and place the little thing there. So it is something that is there. But I think the main question, uh, the other day I went to a workshop at the City Library uh, offered by uh, State Library of Queensland, and one of the things that we were, we were discussing is, was what's our ask? What is it that we're asking of those people who, I was work who we are working with? And I'm taking it into a completely different direction and thinking, what is my ask of my students? Because that's what they will respond to, right? Uh, so yes, they do have to turn in assignments, they have to turn in lesson plans, they have to turn in other things. But even the way, uh, one of the ways that I've been finding to deal with that, and I'm still in the process of learning how to, is uh, how much I assign to each one of those things. So the most important uh, uh, thing that counts for their final grade is their participation in class. And that means being there, that means participating actively, that means trying things out. That is actually the biggest chunk of their letter grade in the end, is not, they have the assignments, there are several assignments with uh, different values to them, but nothing is as big as the chunk that is for uh, classroom uh, class participation. Uh, and their assignments are also reflective of that and are also things that go back and forth. So they turn it in, I give it back to them, they turn it in, I give it back to them. So it's things that are dialogues that go back and forth. One of their final assignments is to create a presentation that they do in class and that we can videotape, they can use it in their, in their um, whatever it is that they're teaching. And again, these students come from very different fields. And I'm talking about one specific class here. This is not the only class I teach, but it's the one I used as an example. They come from very different fields, so they have to grapple with things in ways that is useful for all of them. And I have them uh, creating a story using all of the materials that we explored in class. So how it's graded is that it, it needs to have all of the materials we explored uh, present in a certain way. It needs to be consistent as a story, and it needs they need to be able to explain how would this be useful, how are they their learning, how, how can their students be learning in whatever environment. And I've had people designing lesson plans for whatever it is that they're teaching. So that has been occupational therapy, Saturday school, 11th grade chemistry. It doesn't matter. This is a way of thinking about things that then students are asked to apply to whatever it is that they are teaching uh, and finding ways to even, okay, if you had, say your principal comes in right now, everyone is covered in paint. Uh, what are you going to say? Uh, how are you going to almost justify what you're doing? Not because we need to justify that. Uh, 
uh, as something uh, that is learning, but because we need to be able to understand what it is that we're doing and how are our students learning? How is this exploration part of it? How is, is the things that we're learning by exploring more meaningful sometimes uh, than things that we are just asked to come up with? So I'm not saying there shouldn't be any products. Products are really important as part of the processes. I think that distinction that we often do between process and product sometimes doesn't really have, it doesn't have to exist if the product is part of the process. Everything is coming in together. The way we ask our students to think about things is so that they can not only show us what they learned, but actually use those tools that we're giving them to create that knowledge. And then they can even find the ways to show us that. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question exactly. Uh, you're doing a great job of giving <laughs> me more food for thought, which is the best I could hope for. It's fantastic. Thanks. That's what I try to do myself. I don't have, <laughs> I think we're all again in the business of trying to figure things out and trying to figure how we can help our students in developing their own, their own thing. Okay, was there any final questions from online? No. Um, so the next salon will be held on the 11th of September from 11 till 12, same place, and it will be held by Jason Lodge from the University of Melbourne on the topic of what are we discovering about learning in the brain and can it be used to enhance teaching? Um, yeah, to finish oh, off, another <laughs> fantastic big clap for Marta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.